Welcome to Storytime in Nature at Conservatory Park. My name is Coral with Manatee County Parks and Natural Resources. And today, we're going to be talking about a career. One specific path that led a woman to find her passion. Now this woman is an inspiration to many people within the science community as well as naturalists. And in fact, she has inspired me for years. Her name is Jane Goodall. She's fabulous. I am Jane Goodall, written by Brad Beltzer and illustrated by Christopher Alopoulos. I am Jane Goodall. On my first birthday, my father bought me a cuddly toy chimpanzee named Jubilee. Jubilee, meet Jane. I loved Jubilee. I mean it, loved. I used to carry Jubilee with me everywhere. And as I got older, when I'd line up all my toys and play teacher, Jubilee was the one who had his own chair. Okay, class, now who knows what rabbits like to eat? Yes, Jubilee. Correct as always. I didn't just love my toy chimpanzee, though I loved all animals, even the earthworms I found in the garden. Did you bring the earthworms inside the house? Don't worry, Mom. They're safe as can be. Right under my pillow. My mom told me the worms would be safer in the garden, so we took them outside and buried them back in their homes. At five years old, I was curious to learn how chickens lay eggs. So I crawled into my grandma's hen house to watch. At first, all the hens were scared of me. Then, I decided to crouch in the corner. If I had moved, the hens would have run away. I was patient, though. Finally, after all the hours of waiting, I saw what I was looking for. The hen gave a little wiggle and plop, there was an egg. Where were you? You've been missing for so long. We sent out a search party. You'll never believe where eggs come from. It was my first research project. Would you have been in that chicken coop? I don't know if I would have been. In addition to animals, I also love nature. I named the chestnut tree Nookie and the beech tree Beach. Thank you, Beach, for letting me read up here. Oh, that was another thing. I loved reading. Back then, my family didn't have a lot of money to get books. We went to the library. When I was seven years old, I got a book that would change my life. It was called The Story of Dr. Doolittle. I read it once, then read it again, then read it a third time before it had to go back to the library. It was about a man who could talk to the animals. Wouldn't you love to talk to an animal? What animal would you talk to if you could talk to any in the world? I don't know. There's too many. I want to talk to them all. I want to be like Dr. Doolittle. In a book, there's a parrot who says that if you want to learn how animals talk, you need the power of observation. But what I remember most is the part where Dr. Doolittle and his animal friends are being chased and they come to a cliff. How are we ever going to get across? Right there, the monkeys joined hands. 
and feet. They became the bridge. Isn't that beautiful? We can accomplish anything by working together. A bridge! Quick! Make a bridge! After reading the book, I vowed that I would go to Africa and live among the animals. By the time I was 12, I had my own nature group, the Alligator Club. My friends and I raised money to help old horses. We took nature walks and wrote down what we saw, or at least I did. And if you wanted to have a high rank in the club, you have to be able to recognize 10 dogs, 10 birds, 10 trees, and 5 butterflies or moths. How about I go first? Something tells me she's going to name, name them all perfectly. Each of us even had our own animal name. Jane was the Red Admiral, named after a beautiful butterfly. Do you think you could name that many things? No. When I was 12, maybe. I would have been close. Was I the best student? Not really. On school days, it was hard for me to wake up. I didn't like being indoors. But if we were outside, or there were animals around, that's when I'd get excited. Guess who? How many pets I had. There was a lizard with no legs named Ivor, guinea pigs named Gandhi and Jimmy, racing snails with numbers painted on them, Pickles the cat, Hamlet the hamster, and Peter the canary. And that didn't include the dogs I looked after, who liked wearing pajamas. Woof! That means he likes pajamas. Probably liked them a lot, too. So check it out. I wanted a job where I could learn more about animals. But back then, if you were a girl, people didn't think you could become a scientist. They expected girls to become nurses, secretaries, and or teachers. I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to study animals. Luckily, my mom always told me, if you really want something, work hard for it. If you don't give up, you'll find a way. I never forgot that. Soon, I had a chance. One of my school friends invited me to visit her family in Kenya to pay for the trip. I worked as a waitress and hid my money under the carpet. One day, I closed the curtains and counted it all. That's right, in Africa. I've got enough. I'm going to Africa. Wouldn't you like to travel to Africa someday? I'd like to go back. It's a very cool place. I'm so big, there's too many places. The trip took 21 days by boat. I was 23 years old. It all seemed like a dream until I saw a giraffe who started stare directly at me. It had dark eyes, long lashes, a black tongue, and was chewing acacia thorns. All right, everybody, can you flutter your lashes for me and stick out your tongue? Mm, we don't have a black tongue, do we? Nope, nope. Look at someone's tongue. Not black. What color is your tongue? I don't know. Mine's kind of pinkish. I knew my dream was coming alive. Finally, I was in the Africa of Dr. Doolittle. 
Notice she had to travel by boat. Boat was easier. Probably less expensive too. Two months later, my life changed again. Somebody told me, if you're interested in animals, you must meet Dr. Lewis Leakey. Nice to meet you. I'm Jane Goodall. I hear you like animals. You have no idea. Dr. Leakey was an anthropologist, which means he studies how humans live, and how a paleontologist, which means, and also a paleontologist, which also means he studies fossils and bones. At first, he hired me as a secretary, but he was quickly impressed with what I knew about animals, including his own pets. Eventually, Dr. Leakey told me about a new job, studying chimpanzees up close. He said going into the forest would be hard. It would be dangerous. But if we could find out how chimps live today, we'd learn more about how our own prehistoric ancestors used to live. I have no college degree, no training, and no experience. But I want that job. Jane, I've been waiting for you to say that. For a year, I read everything I could about chimpanzees. They're always observed in a lab. No one has studied them in the jungle, where they actually live. I was also told that women couldn't be alone in the forest. They said I needed a guide, plus a companion. My mom offered to come. I was ready. I knew you wouldn't give up. I'll never forget the day, July 16, 1960, the day I first set foot in what is today Gombe National Park in Tanzania, Africa. At 26 years old, I had finally made it into the home of chimpanzees. It was a place that would change my life. During one of my first explorations, we saw two chimpanzees eating in a tall tree. They noticed us and ran away. The next, we didn't see any chimps. There was no chimps the day after that either. For months, I tried to get close, but they kept running away. Then I started going alone just me. I'd go to a high area called the peak and look down with my binoculars. This was my secret. Be patient. Learn about how they live. Slowly move closer and closer. In time, I saw that the chimpanzees would hang out in groups of six or fewer. The female chimps would be with the children. The male chimps would be with one another, and there weren't, and they weren't, these weren't mindless animals. This was a community. Still, it took nearly a year before I could get within 100 yards of the chimpanzees. One day, I came back to camp and found out. One of the male chimpanzees took our food, including your bananas. Fantastic! That means they're not scared of me now. I bet he'll be back tomorrow. The next day I waited and waited. There was no chimpanzee in sight. Then at 4 p.m., I heard a rustling noise by my tent. Can you make a rustling sound? Yeah. It was the large male chimpanzee with a thick beard. David Graybeard. That was the name I gave him. Back then, people told me there was a certain way to study animals, and that I shouldn't give the chimpanzees names. They said animals were supposed to have numbers, not names. Why? They thought animals didn't have personalities or emotions. 
They thought if we gave them names, we'd start pretending they were like us. That's what no one realized. They were like us. That day, David Graybeard took my nuts and my banana. A month later, he took one from my hand. Even later, out in the forest, he slowly approached me and checked to see if I had a banana in my pocket. It was one of my proudest moments, having the other chimpanzees now understand that I wasn't a threat. I was their friend, and they were mine. Over time, by seeing the chimpanzees as individuals, I could truly understand them. One who wants another banana David was calm, though he liked getting what he wanted. It's okay, pal, calm down. Goliath was easily excited. William was shy. Old Flo was a strong mother, always bringing her daughter and son. As I watched, I learned one of the coolest things of all. One day, I saw David grieve graybeard stripping leaves from a twig, then sticking the twig into a termite mound. He wasn't just using the twig as a tool, he had made the tool. Before that, scientists thought only humans could make tools. There was no doubt now that these animals were intelligent. What an amazing find, right? Every night, I'd write in my journal about what I observed. And every day, I saw the chimpanzees doing the same things we do. Holding hands. Tickling. Kissing. Even patting backs to reassure each other. The more I observed, the more I learned. Soon, I had so much information, I needed a tape recorder. Then I needed an assistant to help observe all the other chimpanzee families in the forest. Six years later, what started with a notepad and binoculars became a full research center. Now I was the one in charge. Isn't it wonderful? Look what we can build together. Today, thanks to our work in Tanzania, the whole world knows that animals have their own personalities and complex relationships. You've done all four of those motions, I imagine, with your family. If you have a sibling, you've definitely done it a couple of times. <laughs> Sometimes maybe not when you want it. <laughs> In my life, people told me there was a certain way to do things, a certain way to study animals, a certain way that girls should behave. They told me to follow the rules. Instead, I followed my gut. In your life, it will be easy to see how others are different from you. But there's so much more to gain if you instead see how alike we all are, all of us. All living things share so much. We have so many things in common when we realize that and look out for each other. That's the most beautiful way to live together. Today, Dr. Goodall's work has grown, reminding people everywhere that we all share the Earth every day. When we protect the planet, 
we protect each other. Even now, along with the Jane Goodall Institute, she's working to save endangered species, including her beloved chimpanzee, while also taking care of our environment. With more than 1,500,000 people, groups of young people, groups, not just people, groups of young people in 133 countries. The Roots and Shoots Network connects youth of all ages who share a desire to create a better world. Give them a call. You can be an environmentalist too. Want to work with animals one day? Watch your favorite animals and see what they do. Make notes, read books about them. They're so much like us. I am Jane Goodall, and I see so much that we have in common. Watch, observe, be patient. I'll teach you this. We don't own this earth. We share it. Listen to the feelings in your heart. We are responsible for the animals around us. We must take care of them. When one of us is in trouble, be it human creature or nature itself, we must reach out and help. When we do, we build a bridge. A bridge that will carry all of us. And here is a timeline of Jane Goodall. You can see an actual picture of her here. You can see all her with Ms. Dr. Leakey and the Roots and Shoots Foundation. Really, really cool. See, what are the other ones? Oh, this was her with Jubilee, the chimpanzee. And then up here, that's her at the research station. The end. Jane knew from a young age. She loved and was fascinated by animals. For goodness sake, she hid in a, <laughs> she hid in a ch it's stinky chicken coop just to figure out how eggs were laid just so she could discover and observe and learn through her own eyes. If that's not love, I don't know what is. Sometimes, something you love can become a career if you really, really try for it. And if you really have the determination that Jane showed. I am one of those lucky people that was able to follow my love. I have a love I was always loved watching, learning, and discovering all the wild spaces, creatures, and plants. And now that I've been lucky enough as an environmental educator for the county to be able to do that. Find a job, find something you love, and maybe you can make it into a career. What do you want to do when you grow up? Let us know. So thank you so much for joining us today at Conservatory Park. We enjoyed having you, and I hope to have you back again soon to some of my story times in nature. Join us again um, every Wednesday this month. We'll be having uh, Discover a New Story. Have a great day, guys.